Good morning, happy Monday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect as usual. Okay, very solid Monday. Sun is out, it's gonna get warm. Business is looking good. Things are coming back slowly, so that's exciting too. So let's dig in to a Q&A. So we're gonna talk about breathing, which is a shocker and a surprise, right? Which, I don't know, breathing's become kind of popular for some reason. But I think a lot of the information is getting misinterpreted. And so, so let's try to clarify a few things by playing off of a question that I got from Adam. And Adam wants to know if his abdominal muscle should be contracted or completely relaxed at rest. So this gives us an opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about what's really happening during resting breathing and then how we're going to apply this um, in certain types of exercises when we're trying to restore movement capabilities or when we're trying to uh, reinforce per performance. So under resting circumstances, you probably shouldn't have to think about your breathing very much. Um, at least I would hope that you wouldn't. Um, in, in most cases of resting breathing, the, the inhalation has some measure of effort associated with it. It's primarily the diaphragm that's, that's creating the negative pressure inside the body that allows you to breathe in. And then it's an elastic recoil of the, of the thorax. The lung tissue actually recoils. You have the eccentric orientation of, of, the, of the diaphragm creating a, uh, a positive pressure and then you exhale. So there's a slight little tweak of abdominal activity at the end of an exhalation that's, that's almost non-existent. In fact, for a long time, they said that there wasn't any. And then there's a little bit of research that says that there is. Um, but, but point being is that most of our resting breathing should be relaxed and comfortable and not require any thought. Now, when I started talking about the two archetypes, when I started talking about wide ISAs and narrow ISAs and classifying them in regards to their, their tendencies, we started to talk about using different ways of breathing to reinforce uh, a, a change to, to get someone to the opposite end of, of this, uh, uh, the, it appears to be this dichotomy of inhalation, exhalation. They're actually occurring at the same time. So it's not really a, a true dichotomy, but because the diaphragm does not descend uniformly in the two archetypes, it requires that there's two different types of breathing when we're trying to restore movement capabilities. So with the narrow ISAs, because of the way that they trap air on the thorax, if we use a high pressure strategy, all we do is reinforce the compensatory strategy. We continue to trap air and we don't make the changes that we're, we've been attempting to change. And, and so we would use a more relaxed mouth, sort of, we always describe it as like fogging up a window, fogging up a mirror type of breathing, because if we can slow down the exhalation, we actually uh, provide time to clear the air that would normally get trapped during the compensatory strategy that a narrow ISA would use. With a wide ISA, we tend to use a little bit more forceful exhalation because what we have to do is we have to, we have to close, we have to close the, the, the wide ISA. And the way we would do that is using superficial musculature like external oblique, which would then narrow that angle. So that actually does require a little bit more of an effortful exhalation. But here's the problem that, that people are running into, especially with the wide ISA archetypes, is that they're using high levels of muscle activity during the, the, the breathing activities and they're using a more forceful exhalation. The problem that you run into with that is, I've already got somebody that's utilizing a very, very strong exhalation, concentric orientation type of strategy, and then all you're doing is reinforcing that during the activities that you're attempting to use to restore movement capabilities. So what you end up doing is you just reinforce the strategy because by driving the exhalation too aggressively, they recruit their superficial strategy just like they're doing under most circumstances and then you don't get the changes that you want. And so we have to take the superficial strategies into consideration whenever we're trying to coach somebody through some form of breathing activity, especially when we're trying to restore movement. Um, so. Under those circumstances, we actually use a very relaxed, casual type of breathing with very slow, methodical movements. 
um, very, very low tension, very, very low effort. And because again, if we have this really, really strong wide ISA superficial concentric orientation, you're never going to get your way out of that by trying to, to use more effort. Because again, you just reinforce the strategy. So again, I would caution you against um, thinking that there's only a way or there's only two ways. What we have to do is we have to consider what this person that we're working with is, is bringing to us. And then we have to reason our way through the, the, the strategies to alleviate whatever we're trying to change or reinforce what we're trying to reinforce. So from a performance standpoint, if I do have somebody that, that has to drive a lot of high force, then I do want to use a concentric strategy. I do want to use this aggressive exhalation. So always taking the individual into consideration is where we go. It's always N equals one. It's always in a gray. Everybody wants a black and white answer when it comes to all, all of these, these concerns. But the reality is that we have to adapt our treatment strategy or training strategy to the individual. So it's not as black and white as everybody makes it seem to be. Um, so please, please, please take that into consideration. So thank you, Adam, for your question. Everybody have a great Monday and I will see you tomorrow.